many of us experienced to various extents the impact of disruption to the food and agriculture value chain during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of us had never experienced widespread empty shelves in the grocery store until recently, and it became apparent how critical every link in our food and agriculture supply chain is and how important efficiency is in this value chain. Additionally, as we face the reality of our consumer behaviors and climate change, sustainable innovations like the ones you'll hear about today are critical to help reduce waste, whether it be food waste, packaging waste, or pesticide runoff. For our panel session, our moderator will facilitate a discussion with the panelists, and then we'll open up to audience Q&A. You'll be encouraged to post questions in the chat or use the hand raise function to ask verbally. Now I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Christina Tamer. Christina is a program director at VentureWell, overseeing our early stage innovator work and has been working closely with entrepreneurs for the last decade. And with that, I'll hand things over to Christina. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. So this is one of my favorite things to do is to highlight and share the stories of our entrepreneurs. So before I get started, I want to uh, make sure I hit two housekeeping things. So one, huge congratulations to Danielle. It's been super rewarding to watch your journey and to have you here today. Such a unique project and such a compelling founder. Um, I'm super excited to get the chance to introduce you all here today to three more founders, and we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to ask you all, please put in the chat, what is your favorite fruit? Not a rhetorical question, and it should be an easy one. Uh, what's your favorite fruit? Give me some answers here. Uh, we got cherries, oh, strawberries, raspberries, pears, awesome. Wow, a lot of fruit fans in the house. So. Now that you're thinking about your favorite fruit, have you thought about how it gets to you, right? We have to think about the packaging. We have to think about the storage. We have to think about the harvest. We have to think about at what point do we know it's ripe enough? Uh, is it gonna go bad while it's waiting to get to the store? How is it treated or monitored on the field? There's all these really complex steps in the value chain that have so much opportunity for introducing sustainability. So it's not just about the food going bad in your house and throwing it away. There's so much opportunity up and down the value chain in food and agriculture to make an impact. So I'm super jazzed to have three founders and startups working on exactly that. So uh, I'm joined today by three E-team entrepreneurs. Um, so let me get started one at a time. Uh, first, I'll start off. Um, with Adam Steger. So Adam, and it's, he's on the right, so he's, because he's furthest upstream in the, in the value chain. So Adam Steger is the CEO and founder of Trick Robotics. Um, they are a startup that provides a service to use ultraviolet light as a non-chemical alternative to pesticides. Um, Adam's been working really hard on developing customer relationships with strawberry farmers uh, in California, and that's his beachhead market. He is super steeped in that industry and in that network. It's been really remarkable to watch, especially as he's come from, uh, just completing a PhD a few years ago in mechanical engineering with a focus in robotics from the University of Delaware. He was really into robots and still is, but now is an expert on all things strawberry farming. Um, so we'll talk to Adam in a few minutes, but just before we get started on that, uh, next and further down the supply chain, we have uh, Catherine, who also goes by Katia. Um, she is the founder and CEO of Strella Biotech. Strella uses proprietary sensors, Internet of Things networks, and, and data analysis to interpret the shelf life of fruits. I believe she's first working on pears and apples. Um, she studied molecular biology and chemistry, along with engineering entrepreneurship at the University of Pennsylvania. And then furthest down the food supply chain, uh, and coming in from a little bit of a different perspective, is Alec. He is the CEO and co-founder of Transfoam which is a manufacturer of biodegradable plastic, which the, with the intention to basically upcycle uh, waste plastic. So one of the applications that he's been considering is using the technology in food packaging. Alec has a uh, BS in biomedical engineering from University of Virginia. So what a fascinating difference in degrees, backgrounds, uh, even different types of food um, sectors being addressed here and different approaches, but all united in trying to infuse sustainability into the food and ag value chain. So this will be our discussion. My plan is to talk to each of them for about five minutes, seven minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so I'll start with you, Adam. 
I would love to hear a little bit about your background and how you got started on solving this problem in, in food and agriculture. Sure. Hi, Christina. Uh, pleasure to be here today. My, my background is in mechanical engineering, so I definitely came from a very technical mindset. I was always that a creative thinker with all these new ideas and everything like that. Uh, I actually worked in manufacturing after I finished my mechanical engineering degree, and I saw that there were robots like everywhere, and I could see that this was going to be a huge part of the future, and I dove into it with my PhD. I found there's only so much you can learn online, so that was a really important move for me. And yeah, I always wanted to make an impact and always, I, I knew I wanted to start a company from when I was young and finally figured out you know, a way of getting into an industry that could really make an impact in the world. I love what you just said about there's only so much you can read online because that's basically like one of the core tenets of all of our programming, right? Your customer discovery is your primary research. It's your intellectual property. So tell me a little bit more about your transition from uh, like look, being a technology, looking for a, a problem to solve versus finding the problem. Yeah, I think uh, like VentureWell was a big part of my mental transition from being just a tech yeah. person solving problems that no one really cared about to talking to customers and understanding that the real value in the world is solving problems that make a difference to real people, not just me and mentally. Uh, and it was actually customer discovery is how we found agriculture to begin with. We were in a totally different industry. My, my PhD work was for the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking for a way to use automation to help people, really. And through customer discovery, we found that agriculture, I've fallen in love with agriculture since then because of how many people that really influences and how much impact we can make solving problems there. So where is your startup now in terms of progress, development, milestones? Well, one of the things that uh, this mental transition I talked about is working with customers. Uh, I love talking with customers and farmers at, or who we work with. And uh, right now we're launching this technology that was really USDA technology to start that was stuck in the lab for 10 years. We've since got that to the farm. Uh, we're showing that these results that were in the lab really work on the farms now. and we're actually starting to scale. So we're getting to larger acres, uh, really demonstrating that this is the future for how we grow our food. So, you know, you didn't really start out knowing that you were gonna focus on sustainability. So how has, you know, an environmental sustainability, uh, you know, consideration or differentiation, how has that factored into your conversations with strawberry farmers? Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. They they've done things a certain way uh, because that's kind of what they had access to. And of course the bottom line is really important, but what I've found is that farmers want to do things differently. They just haven't had access to the right types of technologies. So they're super on board. I'd say most farmers I talk to, they, they say I would be organic if I could. It's just really difficult to do that because there isn't a solution that can help me get there right now profitably. So pretty much like all of the customers want to, to make this transition. And finally, we're in a position where we have a technology that can help us get there. We're not stuck using a technology that's antiquated. And, and back then I don't blame people for using it because I think there wasn't necessarily a better way to provide food for our people. But now that there is, the farmers are so on board with it. Great, yeah. And I love that it just makes more economic sense in addition to being better for the environment. How has that played out in, in the conversations? Like, is there one that's leading? in terms of importance over the other, or is it pretty equal? Well, I think if you're gonna help the environment, you need to have economics that makes sense. I, I think mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to help just to help. And mm -hmm. what's great is technology does evolve in a way that if you just look towards technology to solve things a better way, then you can make a, a huge transition from the way we do things today. So I think now that the technology has got to that point, uh, it's it's a really easy conversation to have with them because the economics of it makes sense and the social good and impact that they can make uh, also makes sense. And I know it took a while to get there. It's not. It's a lot easier said than done. Um, I guess my next question is around the future, right? So where do you see your industry moving in the next five years? You know, farmers aren't always known for being early adopters of innovation, so. How, what's the vibe you're getting from the willingness to make changes and adopt new technologies? It's actually interesting because I think automation is the future of agriculture. We see it kind of up, up the pipeline, warehouses. Now the next most structured environment for a robot to work in is really a farm. 
And, you know, I think that automation is, is ready to be on the farm, but what's been lacking is a way to get it to farmers in a way, to your point, that makes economic sense. You know, this is a solution, what we're doing, replacing these chemicals. It's a, it's a problem that's really important to them. It really affects their yield and their profitability. So they're willing to bring a robot on the farm now to solve that problem. And I think that's just opening the gateway for how much automation can do in the future. But the first step is getting that robot on the farm. And that's what a lot of people have struggled with. And I think particularly uh, data will make a huge impact. But just having a robot to collect data isn't a business. You need a robot that's doing something useful, like treating these pests, and then collecting the data can be this really great uh, way of adding value in the future. Yeah, that's that's great, and it's just been really so fascinating to watch your journey. Um, you know, from you know working on that DoD application to like talking about all of these nuances in in your customers' decision making process and the nuances in your business model. So, you know, as we've talked about your journey to date, what is next for you in terms of milestones and things that you want Trick to accomplish in the next year or so? Uh, for me, it's, it's about getting the business to the point where it's really cash flow positive. You know, having a business that can generate income that I can pay my people with. And by, by doing that, I relieve this pressure to just have an operating business and I can start to focus more on the R&D side solving more problems with this automation, uh, being even more sustainable, even collecting data that can help all the way down the value chain in terms of shipping and logistics, helping reduce waste in the food uh, that, that gets thrown away. I think these are things that are really great opportunities uh, once we have that positive cash flow. I think that should really be a driver that people forget about uh, as entrepreneurs in the beginning. You need to think about how, how the business makes sense so that you can make that impact that you want to make. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's really um, both need to come along together, right? You know, if you're able to sell your product, generate revenue, you're able to sort of reinvest into creating more impactful solutions and innovations that further your mission. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm going to come back to you, but thank you for getting us started. If folks have questions for Adam, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll spotlight some at the end, but you made a nice segue opportunity there, Adam, about going further down the value chain. So we're gonna move next to Katya um, to talk a little bit about Strela Biotech. So Katya, I would love to hear about your background and how you got started on solving this problem. Yeah, sure. Uh, my background is in molecular biology. Um, I was still a student at Penn uh, when I was applying to grad school and frankly procrastinating. <laughs> uh, I was kind of on a neuroscience track uh, and just something about glia wasn't really striking my fancy at the time. Uh, and so I just started reading about other things uh, and at some point stumbled across the statistic that 40% of food is wasted before it's consumed which is like the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of <laughs> uh, and realized that I didn't know where my food came from. And so it started with a simple trip to the grocery store, uh, talking to a pretty befuddled produce manager <laughs> at the grocery store uh, and asking like, where does, where do peaches come from? How do you get these? Uh, and then eventually moving uh, further and further upstream and stumbling across the uh, magical world of apple storage, uh, which is where we started. Love that. You really immersed yourself in the value chain. The poor uh, person in the grocery store probably was a little bit blindsided, but that's great. You really got right there in the heart of it. Um, and I think all of us should probably try to do a little bit more of understanding of where our food comes from. So, so what then, in terms of like getting enlightened into that problem, what did you do to start uh, thinking about solving it? I think it was a lot of reading. Um, in general, what had stuck out to me is that the food supply chain is very similar to that of like a static commodity, like a uh, paper towel, for example. Um, but uh, food is oftentimes a living organism. And so I'm coming out of kind of a more molecular biology background. And so I thought of ways that we could uh, potentially look at the supply chain in a slightly different lens uh, in a more biological one. Um, and then just did a decent amount of reading and a decent amount of asking questions uh, and learned about the apple packing industry. Um, so what packers do is they store apples in pairs um, because those are domestic products, uh, which means that we have a year round supply of apples in pairs, even though they're picked all kind of in October. And what this basically means is that an apple in a grocery store can be over a year old uh, by the time it gets there. 
And the way that it's done is with storage. And I thought that this was all fascinating. I'd never even known that my apple could be a year old by the time I ate it. Um, and started to learn about this process and realized that packers just lack a lot of data on the maturity of their product. Uh, and so they have hundreds of these storage rooms and they don't know where the most ripe fruit is. And so they end up sending whatever they can down the chain really, uh, mostly based on historical data that has been kind of erased by climate change really. Um, and so what we do is we put sensor technology that predicts the maturity of produce inside these storage rooms. And instead of it being a guessing game of like behind which door is the most ripe fruit, we're actually using data uh, to make that decision. It sounds so simple when you put it like that. Um, you know, just a little bit of data can really empower the apple packers to have a lot more information to minimize, not only minimize waste, but also to hopefully work out the economics for themselves a bit better because, you know, lost waste is not only bad for the environment, it's also going to be bad for their bottom line as well. Um, so how in your conversations with your customers, how has sustainability played a role in differentiation and in terms of the value prop? Totally. So Obviously, one thing we really like to do is align ourselves to uh, the bottom line impacts and the top line growth too, right? If you're providing a better quality piece of fruit, uh, then you're increasing the total amount of fruit sold, which is good and healthy. Um, and so that's what's really intriguing about food waste is it benefits absolutely nobody. I think in general, what's mm -hmm. really cool about the ag space is that it's kind of it works well for sustainability. A lot of folks in ag are generational uh, people. So it's an industry where, you know, the orchard is passed down from generation to generation. And so uh, farmers, growers, packers, they have this perspective of what's gonna happen in 50 years, what's gonna happen in a hundred years, what's the world that my kids are going to live in. Uh, and so I think unlike, you know, sometimes we work with public companies and they have quarterly performance and it's not always that clear to explain what that what sustainability is on that short term scale. Um, I think we kind of are lucky in ag that we have a whole bunch of interested stakeholders uh, that are looking at really long term uh, benefits. Yeah, the multi-generational point is so important to the question that Jeff asked earlier. Uh, someone answered in the chat, you know, where do you see yourself in 20 years and really thinking about the sustainability of the of the operation, the orchard operation uh, and their family's uh, well-being in the long run, really making decisions now and technology to optimize uh, operations long term can be really compelling. Um, so where do you see your customers moving in in the next five years or so and what role does Strella play in that? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, in general, uh, the whole of supply chain is getting a lot smarter, uh, both with you know COVID impacts and climate change impacts. So for example, um, this year in uh, Washington state where 80% of all the apples and pears are grown, uh, there was a huge uh, heat wave, a record heat wave mm -hmm. that has never happened ever. Uh, and so folks don't know what that means for the quality of their produce. And so there's no more accurate demand forecasting. There's no understanding of what's going on. And so they're realizing that we need to kind of come up with new solutions as we move into, you know, feeding more people, uh, increased consumer preferences and demand um, alongside these uh, big challenges that we're facing. And, and you all raised a seed round last year, I think it was 3.3 million. Um, so what's, what's next for Strella um, in terms of milestones, thinking, things you want to accomplish and where you want to go in the next uh, few years? Yeah, we actually uh, just closed our Series A, so we raised a million dollar uh, Series A round. Uh, our uh, new investors are Rich Products, which is kind of a, a big food company, uh, Google Ventures, and Millennium Tech uh, Value Partners. So we're super excited to move forward with our uh, rounds of funding. I think the goal there is to start being more connected with the supply chain. So we have a bunch of data that we collect upstream, but we started to actually use that data alongside other data that we generate uh, to inform other uh, supply chain decision makers. So basically what we do is we scatter these sensors that predict the maturity of produce all up and down the supply chain. And we collect a picture of maturity of the product as it's moving and passing from hand to hand. Um, and what we can do is we can inform all sorts of inventory decisions. So right now we work, for example, with some big American retailers to reshuffle their inventory. Um, I think we are all used, used to the fact that when we go to the grocery store, the avocados are like way too hard or way too mm -hmm. much. 
And it's because retailers aren't like super adept at managing perishable products. They do a first in first out system. So first truck of avocados into the DC is the first truck of avocados going to the grocery store. Um, but that doesn't factor maturity or quality or anything like that. So we're working with retailers now to uh, reshuffle their inventory uh, in a way that reduces food waste. Really amazing. Congratulations on the new round. Um, and I just am so compelled by how you're serving different points in the value chain and how that's been like a natural growth for you um, as you've understood more and more about what your product and your service can actually do for folks. Um, so really compelling. And I think that comes out on your website as well. I think you have for, for packers, for retailers. So that's a great example of how the value prop very slightly, even though it's based on the same technology. Um, could you speak to that evolution a little bit, how you've expanded your complexity of understanding? Yeah, I think uh, in general, uh, like as was written in the chat, like food waste benefits no one, that's really true. Uh, so basically anyone that ever owns like a piece of produce as it's being moved, if it gets spoiled, then they it's an impact on their bottom line. And so there's basically a value prop for anybody as the product moves. So the way we've looked at it is we split it up into three kind of major groups. So packers and distributors, then there's importers. So those are folks that are, you know, in transit moving stuff. So for example, we're working with Kiwis uh, traveling from New Zealand into the United States um, and uh, basically arrive at port uh, and they're a black box. And an importer has to make a split second decision about what they're sending to Walmart, what they're keeping in storage, and on top of that, this fruit is like from God knows where, you know, they have no idea where it came from, what it looks like. And so we help them monitor that fruit and make a decision about what to do with it. Uh, and same thing on the retail side. So retailers, they have a much more automated process. And so uh, we kind of integrate into their existing software uh, flows and processes, but basically just reorganizing inventory without changing anything about what they're currently doing, just adding some data to that decision uh, and ultimately uh, making the customer happier. I, I love that, like that you're saying stuff that um, I know, I'm sure you never thought that you would know so intimately about what happens when a shipment of Kiwis are, uh, arrives and how decisions are made. Like you are such um, like a great example of really immersing yourself in your customer's experience. And it like almost has nothing to do with the technology, right? In terms of getting your understanding of the customer that the technology and the solution kind of com comes later, comes after the fact. So um, if for the, those also teaching, you know, innovators and entrepreneurs, I think this is like a really great example to point to of, um, you don't know how specific you're gonna be getting the knowledge in terms of how Kiwis are imported um, when you're starting out, you know, using technology to solve problems. So well done, Katya. A thousand percent. I think what's really cool, so we work in produce, obviously. I think what's really cool about produce is it's so personal. You know, every time I bring up harder, mushy avocados, everyone's like, oh my God, like I've yeah. dealt with that before. And so I think that's, that's what's so compelling to me is food is kind of a universal language for everybody. Um, so we can all relate. <laughs> totally true. Yeah, I love that. Well, well, thank you for sharing and I'll come back to you in a few minutes and congrats again on the, on the Series A. Um, Next, I'd love to go to Alex. So coming in from a little bit of a different perspective, but can you share with us your background and how you got started working on your problem um, and how it relates to the supply chain of food and ag? Yeah, I'm happy to do so. And I'm very impressed by all the Katya and Adam are doing there. Um, so thank you for kicking us all. Um, yeah, I am a biomedical engineer, I guess by degree. I graduated from UVA back in, well, just last May. I'm still figuring out how to, how to best face that. Um, and I am extremely passionate about sustainability, uh, biotechnology, and their intersection. Um, in my time in college, I also found my background um, and my experience really overlapping a lot with entrepreneurship and the community that existed at UVA. And so um, as, my, uh, as my academic career kind of went along, uh, I realized that um, my passion wasn't so much for biomedical engineering in the traditional sense, um, you know, medical devices and medicine, but was, you know, improving the human condition and human health through sustainability and using biotechnology, uh, specifically uh, molecular biotechnologies. Uh, so I started working on um, or in sustainability uh, when I pretty much first started working on Transformer shortly before that. Um, similar to 
uh, VentureWell, or, or <laughs> as prior to me getting involved in VentureWell, I was involved in an organization, an international competition called iGEM, uh, which basically gives students the opportunity to solve world problems using synthetic biology. Um, with my uh, with my team at the time, uh, we started coming up with some ideas, uh, many of which were sustainability oriented, and I ended up selecting Transform, which really was my first hands-on sustainability endeavor, um, simulated startup experience, and deep dive into um, into really what it meant and how it actually applied to the world. Um, so I guess as it kind of relates to my background. I grew up on the water, um, not necessarily the cleanest water, and, and quite overfished waters at that. So I, um, I, I definitely kind of felt the effects of um, what our, um, our practices, that is, I guess, um, food sourcing and production, and um, I guess materials and um, product use as well, was having on the environment. Uh, as a kid, and I also grew up as a waterbottle family. I don't know if anybody kind of shares that experience, if you were like a frequent plastic water bottle user or not. I've kind of heard there is either one or the other. Um, and so when I first dug into my experience with Transform, uh, I was really excited by the fact that what we were making wasn't going to sit around in the environment, wasn't going to be um, harming animals or ourselves. Um, and um, thought that we were going to be making wall models. Uh, <laughs> I admittedly at the time knew very little about the, the value chain, about the impact that uh, we could potentially have or that we were really trying to confront. Um, but nonetheless, it was enough to get us excited, uh, get um, people around us excited enough uh, to really support us and to give us the opportunity to, um, to take things forward beyond, uh, beyond that initial competition and academic research experience. Um, so I can talk a little bit more about my startup experience, probably after Christine asked a couple questions here. Uh, that, was, that was really my first endeavor, my first experience in, in sustainability. That's great. No, thank you for sharing. Um, appreciate you know your lived experience and your evolution of your relationship with you know plastic, right? Um, so that's uh, really sets a good groundwork for what you're working on now. I guess I'm curious to learn a little bit more about like as the rubber hits the hit, began to hit the road with the startup. How did you explore like the food and beverage industry as a potential application? for um, your innovation? Yeah, so I guess I'll use the, the water bottles as a general point for that. Um, we, in our initial search, um, found that there was a lot of interest in the plastic water bottle space. Um, I guess maybe that was something I was a little bit fixed on because of my childhood, but also um, because of what other uh, manufacturers of biomaterials were going after uh, some three to five years ago. Um, it was a, a very hot issue, um, and I guess remains so, but in addition to water bottles, um, there was the issue of plastic straws. Uh, the, the picture of the turtle with the straw up its nose um, really, set a, a, really set a whole movement in motion um, where we were seeing Starbucks and some of the biggest corporations in the world doing away with plastic straws. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that was kind of at the convenience or the expense of the user experience, I think, as many of us have, um, have kind of found. So uh, we realized that plastics themselves, plastics being indicative of uh, not necessarily the materials we're using today, but materials that have the properties that are durable and rigid and insoluble to water, um, these really high performance, really convenient materials had um, a drastic opportunity for impact um, beyond just straws. Um, I'll use that to point to the fact that straws only comprise about 0.8% of ocean litter. Um, and so well, that, or it might even be 0.08%. So while it seems like a significant issue due to the imagery that was captured and all, um, it is far from the entirety of the issue. There's a lot bigger um, problems to confront and a, a variety of Different products and, and applications that need to be um, that need to be really really investigated. So um, 
realizing that, um, or, or first learning that, uh, we continued digging into the problem. And I think what really most caught my attention and really made me dig my heels into what we were doing and um, I think commit to the fact that PHB and biomaterials are integral to our sustainable transition is what I learned about what petroplastics in consumer food service products are doing, not only to the environment, but to our bodies. Um, so the, the fact uh, that, that we go to now is that studies suggest that humans are consuming upwards of 50,000 microplastic particles each and every day, which amounts to about a credit card's worth of plastic each week. Um, I don't know if that sounds appetizing to anybody, um, but uh, no, not not very. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even if it does, um, it, it's it's not great for us. And so, uh, in a, again, in addition to its accumulation in the environment, this is really stemming from its use in petroplastic consumer food service goods, from the microplastic particles that are fragmenting off, that we are shearing off, or that are just left over from the manufacturing process. Um, and so, we really want to see a paradigm shift in the materials that we are using um, that does not come at the expense of the user experience or the user, I guess, societal health. Um, and we, we believe bioplastics are, are a solution to that. Great. Yeah, I mean, the examples that you give and the stats that you give are are, val are very compelling, right? You know, this is a, an area that, you know, can get a lot of people's attention, um, but to make a real tangible change, um, it, it can be tricky, right? So where is your startup right now? And what do you hope to accomplish in the next uh, year or so? Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's always a fun one to answer. Um, we've, we've come a long way uh, since, since that academic research project. Um, we are about two and a half years into our development, uh, and yet we still find ourselves in the prototyping stage. And mm -hmm. I really draw that contrast because it is a long journey, um, but a very worthy one at that. Um, yep, so, yeah, yeah. So we we started off thinking, you know, great, we'll be producing material in no time. We can start testing and, and maybe, you know, again, make that water bottle by the end of year one or so. Um, we, we realized that wasn't going to be the case, but what we are doing now is really um, building out both a robust and reliable model, um, as well as a more efficient and dependable technology that we can not only use to show that we're capable of doing this at the bench top or you know, on our desktop, but um, at the industrial scale where, um, where we are producing the tens or hundreds of thousands of tons, eventually millions of tons of biomaterials that are going to be needed for those petroplastics. So, um, so right now we're producing a couple grams of material at a time. Um, we're continuing to improve our bio process, uh, characterize the material. Uh, and in the next year, um, actually in the next three months, um, we're really hoping to lock down all of the data that pertains to those two factors to start forming partnerships, open up our seed round, and then to, uh, by about a year from now, initiate our first pilot sales program. Uh, so officially releasing a couple of kilograms of transform PHP onto the market, uh, likely in conjunction with our partners. Love it. Yeah, that's some real technical, exciting challenges that I feel pretty confident that you all have been working with the right folks, the right resources. I believe you've gotten some federal funding to continue working on this. Um, it was from the EPA, right? Yeah, we, we had an EPA SBIR last year, and uh, we actually just applied for an SF SBIR on our newer and perhaps more exciting innovation, too. That's great. Yeah, those types of resources um, combined with your passion for the problem and your nuanced understanding of, you know, all of the data and like which players are going to be influencing that data meaningfully, right? So is it worth, you know, going after the straws or is it worth going after something that will make a bigger dent? Both are important, but I feel like you're taking the right asking the right questions of yourself to understand where you should focus your time, uh, which is uh, can't be understated um, as an entrepreneur. Um, so I appreciate you sharing your story. Um, 
I would love to open it up and maybe I can start with you, Alec, and go backwards, but um, what advice do you wish you had been given earlier in, in this process? That's, that's a really fantastic question and um, can span so many different assets or focus areas of like what's needed to, to build a startup or build an innovative technology. Um, I, I would really start with um, maybe even prior to getting involved in Transform and, um, you know, broadened out to my pursuit of entrepreneurship or, or I guess my passions, maybe even more broadly, and say that, um, similar to what you said earlier, Christina, there are so many problems to be solved, um, so many improvements to be made, um, whether it's um, in light of uh, sustainability or uh, improving the user experience, um, you know, again, kind of just taking a step out further each time here with bettering the human experience that yeah. is passionate about it. Um, really just digging in, talking to people, learning about the problem can very quickly lead you to being able to build a solution for that problem. Um, so I guess the piece of advice there is don't worry about not having a great idea or a solution. Like, don't let that stop you from, from and digging in, learning more, talking to people and, and going out and trying to um, going out and trying to do anything. Um, I in that would strongly encourage talking to people. I can say that was one piece of advice that I did fortunately have early on and has really shaped uh, how I approach entrepreneurship. And so I would definitely share that with everyone. You know, talk to anyone and everyone and um, really listen to what they have to say. I think that was also said earlier. Like you might think that one thing is the problem and you might feel really good about solving it. Um, but there are maybe two parallel problems that exist and solving one will solve the other. And you really got to get to that core problem in order to create a, a high impact solution. That's not to say you can't do both or that they can't work together. Um, but I, I would really encourage that you really peel back those layers um, and dig in. Just one more piece of advice that actually pertains to um, starting and then building the company is... Um, is really thinking about your team and your company structure and what that means for both the short and long-term vision and direction that your company could be expected to take. Um, now, I say that knowing that on day one or when you are, you know, clicking incorporate or organize on, on the government, right? like you probably don't know exactly where you're going to be two, five, or 10 years from now, but um, that uncertainty is also something that you can account for, and I would encourage you to talk to people and, um, who have experience in doing so, learn more about, and um, you know, just understand that you don't have to know everything up front, um, but you can work in and account for that uncertainty as you are building, um, and ultimately that will, that will lead you uh, that, that should lead you in the right direction. I'm sure there's plenty more to come, so I'll stop myself there. Yeah, no, that's that's great. If I can summarize, you know, it's really the problems around sustainability, the environment, climate change can feel a little overwhelming. And it sounds like if you focus in on one piece of it and really deeply understand a problem for a specific customer that can do something to change it, that will make it much more tangible in terms of the impact that you can create rather than trying to remove all straws, for example. Um, and, in the, and on the way, make sure that you understand that you know, societal interest in solving a problem is not enough. You gotta really build a whole venture foundation to be able to do that well. If, is, did I summarize that okay? Yeah, I, I think there's some irony between the fact that I am saying focus and yet I cannot be concise or focused. I appreciate you. You did great. You did great. That's my job to help you uh, <laughs> make it all come together. Uh, well said, appreciate Alex. It. Thank you. You as well, Christina. Thanks. Uh, Katya, same question. What advice do you wish you had gotten earlier? Um, I think uh, one of it, one of the pieces of advice is it's not as big of a risk as you think it is. Um, you know, for some reason, especially uh, my peers have always thought, well, I'm for going like a Goldman Sachs opportunity and like a billion dollar salary for starting my own thing. Um, but the reality is it's not like a zero sum game, right? Mm -hmm. If people see you working hard and doing stuff and in general, like 
action causes things to happen. Uh, and so you build up a network, you learn a ton of stuff that makes you valuable in general. Um, and so even if you're taking this in the most uh, cold blooded resume way possible, I think uh, it's still very oftentimes a win win situation. So it's, it's certainly not as risky as I think people uh, make it out to be. Uh, that being said, I don't have uh, a mortgage, children, or really any responsibilities. So um, that's the case. <laughs> uh, so I would I think, argue you have a lot of responsibility. I mean, my team's my family. You know, that's what's that's what yeah. makes things stressful. Is like I have kids on my payroll, basically, and so I kind of do at this point. But that's a different story. Um, I think the second thing is to just do it. Like I have these conversations a lot with like my team. Is like. It sometimes takes 12 emails with no response uh, for someone to answer and say, oh my gosh, I was meaning to get back to you. I just was busy, you know? And so yeah. there's just like pushing and like just brute forcing it at the end of the day. Uh, and oftentimes just going out there and uh, like doing it uh, and seeing what happens uh, is a way better option than sitting and waiting. As they say, if you're not embarrassed of every product version that you put out, then you've waited too long to put it out. So uh, yeah, that's it. Nicely said. Yeah, that I like the MVP uh, plug at the end there. And you're carrying a lot. You know, it's 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 a big deal to have, have a team, you know, counting on you. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing, Katya. Uh, Adam, same question. What advice do you wish you had earlier? Um, well, <clears throat> I think one of the biggest things that is on my mind now today is and kind of reflecting on what Alex said a little bit at the end there is the team. I think, you know, you get into something, you put your head down and you really try to solve the problem for a customer. You can really have this interaction where it's just you and the customer so much that you forget about the fact that as you start to scale, especially if you're a technology based team, you're, you don't have a really round skill set. And there's, there's really, you can learn a lot through programs like VentureWell, but there is a point where to scale a company from you know, thousands of dollars in revenue to millions of dollars of revenue, you need someone who's had some experience doing that before. And that's like, that's hard to say as a you know, founder CEO who really wants to go, you know, make this big uh, understanding that you don't necessarily have all the skills that you need earlier would have been helpful because then you're, you find this, this, you're in this position where you're in a pinch where you're saying, well, I'm ready to scale but I need to find that person who can really be part of my team and help me get there. So I think if I had that, uh, if I had thought about that earlier, I would have kept my eyes out for it. Uh, instead of kind of rushing to find that person, I might've been able to fill that role in a more slow, maybe part-time type of thing. So I think that is really important. Um, also, also like, I think it's important to remember that not all customers are equal as you start to build your business. <laughs> Because you can get really caught up with one or two customers that have so many ideas about, they're telling you how good your product is, you know, they're selling it for you, to you, but then they have all these features that you want to, they want you to add. And you can get hung up just on the technology because you think you're doing something that's valuable for the customer. But you have to really step back and say, is that going to help me build it, build this into a business? Or is that kind of more of like a project, you know? So I think that's like being self-reflecting and understanding when you're kind of uh, going on a tangent also. <laughs> no, you, you said it really well. Um, two, two things that I thought of there, I agree with you on, you know, there's a different skill set that's required once you've kind of found product market fit a little bit and you're beginning to scale, but I wouldn't underestimate or undervalue your role in your work to date. Um, like you, you, all three of you um, and Danielle as well, like your per personal understanding, passion for the problem, your interfacing with the customers, like you know, being in the strawberry fields, like that really um, cannot be replaced and they can't be hired for. Um, yeah. So that's very, very important. But that said, you know, our venture development framework ends at commercial launch and then it becomes a whole different set of challenges. And there, there's many of them. Read uh, Trisha Compass Markman's case study on this. Um, it really, it, the journey doesn't end. So I, I agree with what you said, but also want to just like make sure you're giving yourself credit for what all of you have done so far. Definitely. I think also when it, when you say team, it's not just the team that's, you know, sitting around a table with you or going to talk to customers. It's also, it extends to people like you, Christina, who have acted as mentors for us. I knew pretty much nothing before as buyer about investing uh, in the investment world, really. Uh, and I think that having you uh, to support my knowledge and really build me up as a CEO in terms of what I know, 
uh, that has been extremely helpful. So bringing those people on to, that can help fill those gaps is another way, not just adding them to your team per se. Yeah, that's really sweet. I appreciate you saying that. And it's been a, a, a pleasure to watch all of you grow and learn um, and just to be a small part of your journey. So thank you for letting us do that. Um, would love to open it up in the last you know, five minutes or so to questions from the audience. I know Victoria had one. Um, Victoria, if you'd like to come off mute, you're more than welcome, but I can represent for you. Um, talking about the image of the turtle and the straw, that was a big call to action for Alec in particular. So, so any of you, did other images, like big iconic images, um, get you excited or impassioned to start solving uh, problems in the climate and sustainability? If, if I could jump in here. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, like, the turtle definitely helped the movement at a national level, but it was really all this more granular data, you know, the facts about um, uh, the straws actually comprising such a little component of, of the waste stream and um, what cigarette butts are doing and the fact that they are made out of plastic, which many people don't realize, and just, like, how many things around us are plastic and we just hadn't thought about previously and then I, I think just the facts and stats around that like we use um six or seven hundred billion pounds of plastic around the world each year um i, I can't even conceptualize how much that is i forget some of the comparisons they make some 20 or plus uh empire state buildings all combined um definitely more than that uh, one other one though that um well we were already in it really, I think, reinvigorated me was what we learned about the impact COVID would have on the environment. I think at the outset, everybody was really pleased to see dolphins returning to the canals in Italy and um, other instances of the reduced impact on the environment. Um, mm. and we very quickly realized that due to the new considerations for sterility um, and, and other conveniences, um, that waste was actually going to be perpetuated far more um, than it was previously. And so um, it, while they might've been Photoshopped, images of turtles with masks um, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, just waves filled with medical and, and mask litter um, really was, was a, a second call to action. Um, and, and a refocusing. Great. Yeah, thanks, Alec. Like, I, I know we all were looking at, yeah, the as people stopped moving around, what were the changes in the environment during the pandemic? Um, Tom O'Donnell, I'm reading your comment here. Do you want to chime in on that, Tom? So for those who uh, are old enough, the, the commercial on TV, that showed an elderly Native American with a tear in his eye, looking out on the landscape with all the trash. It just changed how people thought, at least for me anyway. That's great. I think these like societal iconic moments and imagery really does have an impact. I think, you know, it's kind of what, why Alec is, is getting started, but then there's also not to understate the value of like finding these sort of hidden opportunities as well, right? Like I like to Katya's point, she just went to the grocery store and started talking to a person stocking the shelves. So you never know where you'll find inspiration 